John Sherman, J-O-H-N-S-H-E-R-M-A-N. Great, great. What was your family doing in 1964? They had a dairy at this location. Uh, they were milking between 10 and 12 dairy cows, grade B. Okay. And um, what were you doing during this time period? I was working for the state of California, and at that time known as the Division of Highways. What do we know that as now? Caltrans. Okay. And um, what sort of problems did your family run into during the flood? Uh, mainly, they were they were elderly. My father was elderly, and uh, health problems along the way. And I was taking care of the the dairy business for him, and yet working for the state of California at the same time. So uh, again, they were living here and uh, we were managing in that manner. Down in the Arcata Bottoms, and, and this area got hit pretty hard by the flood. This area was inundated with water. Uh, it all began on the 21st of December. Uh, I was alerted. Uh, we have a little problem. We're going to fight with the horses right now. Yeah. My voice change. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> Not in that way. It didn't seem to be rubbing. Yeah, it is kind of rubbing on here. Yeah. Jen, I'm on the other side. I'll just bring it. I'll just bring it up. There. Okay. 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 Yeah, there was a little rumble there, and I don't know where it was coming from. Yep. Sometimes that. That's probably from that breakfast. <laughs> Revenge of the. Oh yeah, that's uh, the nice to have in the background. Juice. It was the tomato juice. <laughs> okay. Okay, so we're gonna, um, we'll start over. How, how's that coming through? Because I hear the dog barking. Can you hear that? In the, can you hear the dog barking? No, you had no, no, Okay, no. we'll just keep on going then. And uh, so tell me about the flood um, as it affected this area of the Arcata Bottoms. And if you could use complete sentences too, because we're gonna cut me out of this. Okay. Uh, I was first alerted that there was a possibility of a flood that was going to occur. I think it was on December 20th of uh, 1964, in the evening hours. I was contacted by a friend of mine from Neyland Prairie uh, by the name of Henry Russo, R-O-U-S-S-E-A-U. -S -S -E and Henry had said to me that they had had a lot of rainfall in their area and there was a stream that he was crossing and trying to cross that he could not cross with his, his boots and that we were gonna have a flood the next morning. So I took it from there that I better be on alert for the folks and keep them apprised of uh, the high water that may be uh, anticipated. In the morning of December 21st at about 6.30, I received a call from my sister and she had said that uh, Gentoli Lane, that's G-I-U-N-T-O-L-I, was under uh, flood water from Mad River. I left the house, went up next to the river, which is east of this place where we are presently, and the water was level with the road. By the time that I had turned the car around in reverse order, the water was at least a half a foot over the road. We'll have you say that last part again. The water was? At least six inches over the top of the road, flowing, beginning to flow across the fields. Um, we elected, we elected to stay down at this location instead of vacating or evacuating. Um, the only problem in evacuation from this location is that we get a tendency or I always have a problem of getting cut off from high flows that uh, traverse the area of Arcata, of this, out of Arcata Bottom land, uh, southeasterly from this point. The water at that depth is generally about six foot. So we stayed at this location and helped all the rest of the neighbors out that uh, stayed here. Uh, Emerson Graham stayed here or stayed in his house nearby. Uh, John Perfrini stayed in his house nearby. Judith Perfrini stayed in his house nearby. Uh, and the cars stayed uh, nearby or down the road from this partial. Um, all most of the women, with the exception of my mother, 
uh, he uh, vacated the area. They went to Arcata. So the rest of us stayed here. Uh, we had a we had a we pulled our food. We pulled our whiskey. Uh, had a card game. And uh, enjoyed ourselves. That's all you can do during the times of high flows. Uh, we experienced no loss of cattle at this location. The neighbor, uh, I think he lost uh, 21, or no, he lost 13 head of beef cattle. And this actually occurred mainly because of uh, uh, you try to try to move the cattle and they got swept out and drowned in the fence and everything else. So he wouldn't have moved them. He wouldn't have lost it. Uh, another neighbor had to move his mother out. They moved her out by uh, horseback to the railroad trestle and then moved her to McKinleyville. Um, I was down here from the flood time until we got out of this area. The first time we got out of here was uh, about the 23rd, I guess it would be, of December. That's the first rig that, rigs that came in. Tony Borges came in with a, uh, with a uh, tractor uh, scraper, pretty good sized tractor to get in this area. The other people had tried to get in here with big equipment, but they mired down and got the equipment stuck and couldn't get in or out, so they had to walk out on the railroad trestle. Uh, power was out. We lost our power. Uh, we didn't have power for three or four days, uh, mainly because bolts were knocked out. Uh, uh, bolts were knocked out adjacent to the river, uh, just to the east of us. In this area where I'm, where we, where I live right now, presently, we're sort of on a little bit of an island in here, protected. Uh, water goes around us to the north side. Uh, and also goes around to us on the south side, so we're sort of protected, but we are sort of stranded. We had an outlet to get out of here at that time, and that was a railroad track, but now we don't have a railroad track. We have a bridge to the Hammond Trail. The trestle is gone, so we're sort of here on our own, unless we have a boat, and then we can get out of here in that manner. Uh, so when you get down to it, uh, I really don't know what will happen on the next flood that we have in here. Uh, there's been a lot of land surface changes. We have all of the building that has, has happened over Gentoni Lane. Uh, a lot of building that's gone in Pacific Manor. These are all areas where we've had the Manor River was allowed to flow before, but won't be allowed to flow this next time. So I don't know if I'll stay down here next time or not. Probably not. I'll probably vacate this area and go to a motel in Eureka. That might be the safest place to be. Um, and then on the, I was actually off work from uh, uh, Caltrans during that time, on compensating time off. I had accumulated a lot of overtime uh, during the previous summer, so I was off on compensating time. And uh, anyway, why? I turned around and uh, I went to the office to collect my paycheck. Well, that's what the time you said we have an assignment for you up on Willow Creek. So I accompanied a convoy into Willow Creek. Convoy into Willow Creek or on Highway 299 was done, I think, twice a day. And uh, I went up in the morning, went up uh, with escort of uh, National Guard plus Caltrans, or I should say at that time, Division of Highways. Uh, to a bridge site that was a bridge washout that was right immediately north of Bullock Creek on Highway 96. It was a sign there. Uh, the only mode of transportation in and out was on emergency would be by helicopter because the road was actually washed out between Berry Summit and Willow Creek. There was no road. The road was gone. Uh, the only road that was there was a road that was provided by D8 tractors or D7 tractors, and you were pulled over to and from uh, uh, Bullock Creek when you were going in that direction. How did they do that? How did they pull the vehicles over? They actually were building the road, and they'd back the dozer back down and hook a line onto you and, and take you up, uh, assist you to get up through this 
this quagmire, and this is what we were working in. Everything was just nothing but mud and slop. Uh, so that's uh, the way it was in and out of that country. The only way you could get out of there is on an emergency, is on a helicopter. Uh, the bridge site that I worked on was a bridge site. We went down to see what the bridge looked like. The bridge washout. The washout was such that the bridge was completely gone, had completely gone to, uh, that was over Willow Creek, had completely gone into the Trinity River. The only mode of transportation across that creek was a cable. Uh, the cable was, uh, I can't recall the di diameter of the cable, but it was a trolley that was built on the cable, uh, made out of a 55-gallon barrel and a uh, small platform. And it was an experience and a half to travel across this uh, trolley. Of course, it was a descending grade from the Willow Creek side to the north side of the bridge. But then on the other side, it would be an ascending grade, so they'd have to pull you back and forth. And again, you would cross this stream, whether it was be seven, eight feet of water flowing at nighttime. Not a, not a, not a, uh, not a joyful event. It was uh, pretty scary. Uh, worked up there, we got the bridge in, part of the bridge in, and then it started to rain again, and we lost the bridge. Had to tear the dismantled bridge again, start all over, and then uh, put the bridge back in so we get traffic between Hoop Off and Willow Creek. Uh, traffic was closed completely. Everything was moved in this in, around this area by air, helicopter. Uh, there was something else to see all the aircraft in this area. Uh, then I was up uh, after we finished that project, uh, we went to Pepperwood. Can you have to stop for a second, just wipe your mouth, it's a little bit, just a little white. Yeah, I'm sweating like that. Yeah, a, I know, it's like warm in here. It's something else. Do you want us to open the window? Yeah, open that window right there, the top one right there. Yeah, it'll open real easy, just kick her up. There you go, there you go, whatever like, falls. It's like being in the hot seat. <laughs> oh yeah, it's, really it's a hot, hot seat, yeah. It's definitely a hot <laughs> seat. <laughs> Excuse me. Sure. Uh, so tell me about Pepperwood. Pepperwood. Okay. Pepperwood was a was a project. It was the uh, clean my nose a little bit here. Uh, Pepperwood was actually a project uh, that was the realignment of Highway 101 between Redcrest and Stafford. Uh, we had an office in Pepperwood. We had just settled in. When I said we, I'm talking about Vision Highways. We just settled in Dennis' office. I had some gear in the office, uh, personal items. I had worked down there uh, uh, previously uh, that year or the year before. And we had all our books in the office. We had all the survey equipment in the office. And the office got lifted in the flood. And I don't know how much water went through that area. There was probably 15 to 20 feet of water. And it took this building that we're in and it slammed it up against a big uh, uh, hedge of trees and everything flew out of the house uh, and we were down there uh, uh, salvaging all of the paperwork for that project and that would be all of our survey notes and everything imaginable and then hauling all that to Eureka and then laying all that paper out on the floor of the basement to let it dry. Uh, and then uh, I was working at that time at the, on the alignment, on the new alignment for the Pepperwood Freeway job. So we were surveying on the Pepperwood Freeway drive job, uh, doing that work after the flood, and driving down through Pepperwood, and you'd see large barns sitting right in the middle of the roadway. Uh, these are photographs that are readily available, and uh, again, uh, it was a sight to really see of how much damage was really done with the magnitude of that flood. Uh, traffic, or I should say driving to and from Pepperwood was very uh, extensive. Uh, to get to Pepperwood, you could not just drive down Highway 101 through Scotia and Riedel because the bridge was uh, severed at uh, Riedel 
and you'd have to travel down through Ferndale and go around on the Bridgeside Road and go through uh, that road would would come would uh, would exit out on Highway 101 right at Riedel, and then you could cross a wooden trestle bridge at Riedel, Scotia, and then you'd go to be able to get down to Pepperwood from there. One of the old, one of the brand, one of the newer bridges that was uh, constructed down just south of Scotia did not make it through the flood. It was washed into the river. The old bridge is a bridge you used for your travel to and from Pepperwood. So we worked down there for quite a while, uh, for about two or three months. And then after that, uh, spring came on and summer came on and then we started in the tour of reconstruction of a lot of projects without, throughout the district. Uh, the number, I forgot how many numbers of, or how many bridges were actually damaged or destroyed in the North Coast, but it was a, uh, a larger number in Del Norte, Humboldt, and Mendocino counties. But uh, the uh, storm damage, or I should say reconstruction, was, never com was not completed in a lot of these projects until about 1967-68. So again, uh, it was an experience and a half to go through most of this. So when you had the little whiskey drinking party here, how did you feed everybody here? We, uh, did you use the wood stove? We had a wood stove. Uh, <coughs> we uh, pooled the booze, had, had enough change to make change for, for a poker party. We had a good time. Yeah. I, got, I have a nice picture of that. You guys look great. Um, you were telling me a little bit about the, um, when we were talking on the phone, you were uh, telling me a little bit about the effect of the tide on the flood. Okay. The tidal action. You want to take a, just a little break? The, no, no. Oh. The tidal action really does have an, a, a, a dire effect on, on floods in this area. And that, uh, it has, uh, there's probably two effects right now uh, on, a, on a flood in this area. One is a tide that uh, if you have a high flow of runoff, from the hills and you have a very high tide and you have a southerly wind, it seems to push this water back uh, up on the river, makes the water back up to a point where it really actually floods quickly, more readily than it does in, on a natural flow. Uh, on a natural flow, you, you might have a flood that uh, the rise would be, let's say, about a foot an hour. But if you have a natural flow, a rise of a foot an hour from a natural flood, and then you have a flood tide that starts backing that water in. You might have a, a rise of uh, two foot an hour. An example is given in a, fl a flood that we had after that point. It would be uh, in, uh, I think it was about 19, I can't recall what year it would be. It was just a few years ago, we had a, a flood uh, in, the, in this area, but not right here to the my west. And I actually walked, uh, went down the road to tell the neighbor that there's a flood that's going to occur, and he didn't believe me. Uh, he drove down the road to see how bad the water really was, and it was an incoming tide, uh, a very high tide, incoming tide, and it was stormy. Uh, where the where the Ham Trail Bridge is located, I actually met the water at that point, starting to uh, come out out of the out of the banks of the river, starting to flow down the road at at the at the Ham Trail Bridge. I went back to his house and told him that there was flood water that was approaching. We had to go down to his lower end of his uh, uh, property, marshland, and get his cows and calves out. We actually went down. <coughs> <coughs> And uh, the flow walking across the field was such that there was no, there was no, uh, there was no uh, flood water present in the field. Uh, just surface water, natural surface water. We walked down to the lower end of the ranch to get these cows and calves, and we got back, and his daughter was along at that time, and she had to actually hold on to his belt coming across the fields on this fence because the flood of water was about a good three foot with current moving. And we'd only been 
on that lower end of that ranch for probably no more than 45 minutes. So that tells you how fast these things to occur. They actually advance quite quickly on an incoming tide. And that's what actually pushed that flow over as quick or as fast as it actually did. The other thing now that I have some concerns about is uh, we don't take the gravel out of the rivers anymore. And therefore, uh, gravel was always being extracted out of the rivers. So therefore, when you have a, a flood or a, a amount of rainfall with that magnitude occurring, uh, will the river be capable now of being able to handle, handle uh, a runoff with that much, with, with a flow of that magnitude? How does the gravel change that? Well, it's the stream bottoms are actually raising. Again, the, the bottom of the, the bars are actually starting to come back. Uh, take, for instance, uh, right nearby here, we had just got finished doing a big project uh, in McKinley. And a lot of the gravel aggregate that was used for the base, sub-base, symmetrated base, the asphalt, all came from Mad River. That was all rock coming from Mad River. So that gravel was not present in those bars at that time. So if that rock would have been there, probably the flood would have been worse. But now, we have not been taking the gravel out. So now, that gravel is back. Excuse me. The, uh, the brush, or I should say the vegetation on the banks are such now too. They've grown, they've grown for 50 years. So therefore, that also has a tendency to uh, uh, make the void smaller for the flow of, of, of water. So I have some real concerns along the way here. What's going to happen in the future? I looked to the waste of me up here. I see where there was property that was wide open before it was pasture land. People have moved in. Houses have been built. Trees have been planted. Uh, Hey, or I mean, not just a hedge, I'm talking about a forest. What's that gonna do when the flows come this next time? Good question, I don't know. All right. <laughs> but I think that's a very good question. So that's about sums everything up, pretty much so. And you were talking, you when I talked to you on the phone, you talked about moving cattle and actually having to swim them around. Uh, my cousin, which is south of Samoa Road, was a flat, affected by the flood not on the same days that we were here. So it's a natural contour, the natural elevation of the fall of the ground actually goes toward the Humboldt Bay. Water flows toward Humboldt Bay. There are maps available actually shows how the stream, or I should say the channels were at, at the time of the 64 flood. Uh, and all this water has to go someplace. So as, as it flows to the southwest, it gets butted up against the dikes that are around the bay. So therefore, those individuals that are living uh, between the dikes and the uh, uh, small road or Route 255, they're going to get this water after we have the water. So like I say, I'm, like I'm saying, it's two days after the uh, flood occurs here, they have the flood. And they are actually towing, uh, towing cattle out to safety with the, route, with the use of a uh, outboard motor and a boat. And they just go to uh, come in and they would actually uh, put a lariat around the cow's head and take her out in deep water and tow her uh, to safety and then let her get her footing so she would be able to get back up and get back on safe ground. But that's how they moved livestock. Uh, Lois Wallace actually had water in her house. And uh, again, uh, more details can be provided by her. She was to tell you exactly what they went through. And they went through something else for, for three or four days after the flood was already done here. I can't imagine having to clean all that mud out of your house. The mud is something else. The only building here in this place here that received any, any of that silt was the garage. That's the only building. And that is, it is, it is, that mud is like slime. You know, you can wash it out. And pretty soon it's, it's still there and it's very slick. And I mean, you have to have good boots to walk on it. If you don't, you're going to fall. You're going to fall. And as old as I am, I can afford that. Yeah. <coughs> so anyway. Okay, let's see. Mm, I think you kind of...
covered mo uh, everything that I had on my list. Um, anything else you'd like to share about the flood, your experience? No, the no. I don't know. Well, it's like uh, one thing I went through. I was quite young at that time. I was only... I was only 13 when we had the one in 55, so I was here in 55, so we did a little preview at 13 to see what happened then. So when, when 60, 1964 flood came along, I was 22 years of age, so I had a little bit more knowledge than I did, than I did when I was a kid by a long shot. So uh, anyway, it was, uh, it was something else to go through one of those again, learn a lot, and I don't know if I'll be prepared for the next one or not, but Probably will hope to be still here. Good. You guys have any questions? So, any questions? so John, I was going to ask you, you the, how deep was the water right around here? All right. Um, just in, in the garage is all? The garage is the only one that had water. Uh, when you came up the steps out there, it was up to about the second step. Uh -huh. And the water would flow under the house. You could hear the water boiling. And that's when we played, that's when we had the card game. And it was the best time right there, especially when you have a little whiskey to drink. and. Uh -huh and uh, play cards and win the neighbors win the neighbors money you know one thing about it is they weren't going to get it out of here <laughs> right it's one of those things you can't take the money and run that's right no place to go <laughs>